good uh, well afternoon for me everybody I see we have uh, participants from uh, all over the world from uh, Japan which is a very late at night uh, to uh, Mexico which is a very early in the morning so I'm very grateful for uh, your presence uh, here, uh, which makes it a truly uh, international uh, event. And uh, thank you for waking up early or going to bed uh, late as the case may be. Anyway, so welcome to our Coffee Public-Private Task Force webinar on regulatory trends and developments for supply chains, the case of coffee. Uh, as the work of the uh, task force expands across different technical work streams and topics, we wanted to uh, step back a moment and highlight the importance of regulatory frameworks in coffee importing countries to the achievement of a sustainable and prosperous coffee sector. Regulatory trends and developments can be a key driver and incentive for companies to ensure that sustainability risks, such as human rights violations, as well as deforestation and other negative environmental impacts are eliminated from coffee supply chains. As such, today's session directly contributes to the activities set out under the market linkages track of technical work stream four and uh, to related commitments uh, regarding the task force roadmap to promote and uh, incentivize sustainable sourcing. Um, in addition to its focus on resilient coffee uh, landscapes, the fourth uh, technical work stream has concentrated on demand side measures by setting out the target to ensure that by 2025, only uh, just over uh, three years from now, uh, at least 50% of uh, coffee purchased by roasters and retailers is produced and sourced according to sustainable practices. This target has been approved and adopted for inclusion into the overall roadmap and has also reinforced the alignment between the task force and the Sustainable Coffee Challenge. Today, we will learn about the policy dialogue currently taking place in Europe. In the ICO's latest coffee development report, whose theme is the sustainability, inclusiveness, and resilience of the coffee global value chain, we point out the need for a, what we call a smart mix of market-driven initiatives and regulatory schemes. Um, with regard to today's uh, um, program, I, am, uh, I regret to inform you that uh, health issues have present, prevented our first uh, speaker, Ms. Uh, Rothermeyer of Germany from uh, joining uh, us today. We will reschedule her presentation for a later date. However, we still have a very interesting presentation about the Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative at the level of the European Union, the world's largest uh, coffee consuming market, and which is highly relevant since the entire coffee sector will need to adapt its sourcing strategies to this emerging regulatory context. This will require innovative uh, approaches within supply chains and an enabling environment to stimulate sustainable production. I wish you a very informative session and an engaging uh, discussion. Uh, we will start with uh, some opening remarks by uh, Dr. Leonard Mitzi. He is the head of the unit for rural development, food security and nutrition of uh, the Directorate General for International Cooperation and Development of the European Commission and 
above all, he is a very good uh, friend to the ICO. So uh, welcome back, uh, Leonard, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jose, and thanks to all colleagues. I see more than 120 participants in this meeting, thanks to Wolfgang. And in duo mode with Matthias, who is a colleague in DG International Partnerships in the European Commission, uh, we come from the directorate in charge of what is known as the EU Green Deal and the digital components. It's a very thematic uh, um, directorate. Uh, Matthias comes from the private sector, blending innovative finance part. So we try to do a, a duo mode because when we speak about regulatory issues, clearly regulation has a number of facets of which uh, uh, the EU Green Deal, which I will explain briefly in my introductory remarks, is at the core of this commission, the new commission, which uh, took uh, office um, now for a couple of years. Um, it is the flagship of this, uh, of this commission, uh, building up on three pillars. In agriculture and food systems, we have what is known as the farm to fork, but we also have pillars around biodiversity, around climate change. With the uh, unveiling of a major initiative as a proposal known as Fit for 55, which was just unveiled last month on the 14th of July, which encompasses um, aspects around forestry, around land use, land use changes, um, emissions trading, uh, um, uh, also issues around um, uh, aviation and maritime fuel, and carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, the European Union wants to show leadership across the globe in terms of climate neutrality by 2020, reduction of emissions by 55% by 2030 on 1990 baselines. Now, how does the European Union operate in your different countries? Um, we are actually in the final stages of what is known as programming, meaning that we have a substantial budget um, for development cooperation for the period 2021-2027, and we are finalizing our budgeting um, in the different nations across the globe, uh, both in Africa, Latin America, Caribbean, Asia and Pacific. Um, we have, for example, for those African participants we have a new Africa summit coming up in the first months of 2022. The date is not uh, known. And we would like that after the programming phase is completed, which will be by the end of this year, uh, we can start engaging with you um, how certain value chains of which coffee hopefully will be one of the main value chains uh, which could be prioritized in the countries where coffee is produced, um, the uh, rolling out of the EU Green Deal. As uh, Jose mentioned, for us as European Union, um, the human rights component, uh, whether it's ch child's rights or child labor or uh, gender or issues around um, corporate governance that uh, Matthias will elaborate, or deforestation, there will be the unveiling of a proposal by the end of the year from our colleagues in the G environment on um, deforestation free value chains. Um, this is going to be a key aspect also in the accompanying process of our programming, meaning that uh, if a country or if operators want to benefit from funding, there is also a need of compliance that has to be accompanied. And there will be TA, there will be a technical assistance component, and also innovative blending and financing instruments. Why? Because this will not only just be a grant element, if we want to be transformative um, in a regulatory or in a hybrid approach between uh, a regulated approach and a market oriented approach, it also has to be accompanied by strong private sector buy-in. And the governments, especially in COVID and post COVID, hopefully, uh, we start seeing a bit the benefits of the vaccine in 2021 and parts of 2022, then we can see a bit of better recovery in 2022 and beyond. 
hopefully we also see that the private sector can start signaling um, uh, a re-engagement at sectorial level, and this will require the unleashing and the mobilization of innovative financing instruments. This is the role of our financial institutions. And with Jose and with all of you, we would like to engage with our financial institutions. They are European development financial institutions. I'm, I'm speaking of the likes of the European Investment Bank, of KFW, of FMO, of Casa Depositi, and Prestiti, those operating and the Agence Française de Development, de Development, the French agency, those operating at country level so that we can unleash innovative financing instruments. One area as well, which is important to accompany in terms of the regulatory and market orientation of new regulation is actually um, the taxonomy on sustainable finance. Uh, we need also to target sustainable finance on criteria which um, accompany the EU Green Deal and the taxonomy linked to the EU Green Deal. Um, our standard setting is set by trying to achieve the highest social and environmental standards possible. Um, uh, if one looks at the EU farm to fork strategy, there is a clear strategy on the reduction of pesticides, for example, or on going and increasing area and acreage around organic agriculture. We would like to engage with you, whether private sector, whether farmers' organizations, on how best the transformation of agri-food systems, in this case of coffee value chains, from the bean to the final uh, coffee uh, production, can actually be accompanied. This would require clearly the empowering of farmers' organizations. That is a part, a component, which we will continue in terms of strengthening farmers' organizations, strengthening the cooperative movement, empowering women farmers. The gender dimension is very important, but also giving the tools, including the digital tools, to young farmers, to new vibrant um, entrepreneurs to actually engage in the farming sector. It is only through the provision of innovative um, digital platforms and new techniques that we can really be transformative to accompany any regulation uh, that will have to come to steam because this will be uh, done in a sequenced way. We are not trying to push um, an agenda which is not also discussed and dialogued with you, but it's also a signal that if you want to engage with the European Union and the European Union markets, um, we want to signal that we want to, to enhance the environmental and social standards. We can't continue affording deforestation across the globe. Um, and this is a signal that we are already conveying in the fora and the summits that are happening this year. We have had a few weeks ago, the pre-summit in Rome on the UN Food System Summit. We go to New York in, in a virtual mode on the 23rd of September with the UN Food System Summit. And these are the topics which we are discussing in pragmatic terms. If we speak about living income, living wages, if we speak about zero hunger, if we speak about a human rights approach to value chains, these are the issues that we want to granularize, uh, whether it's coffee, whether it's cocoa, whether it's palm oil, whether it's livestock. What we are trying to do is calibrating a bit um, an initiative around cocoa. It might not be applicable 100% for coffee, but this could be a benchmark after cocoa and we have been discussing the COCO initiative with Cote d'Ivoire, with Ghana and Cameroon, and hopefully we can um, roll it out at the right moment once uh, we engage with other countries, but consolidating based on the uh, living income differential of COCO prices, but also on a clear, robust approach in terms of deforestation-free value chains um, with the countries concerned in West Africa, this could also be a case that we can calibrate for the coffee value chain if it is successful. The difference between coffee and cocoa, as you know, is that cocoa is pretty much consolidated around three or four countries globally, mainly two countries in West Africa. The coffee value chain is much more fragmented globally. So it was easier 
also because of the engagement of the countries concerned to start the dialogue with COCO. Hopefully, this can also be engaged with um, coffee and other value chains, because when we speak about deforestation free value chains, it also affects um, other value chains beyond uh, COCO. I, I conclude briefly on this. I will give the floor to Matthias, who will elaborate a bit more on the sustainable governance, which are to you. Over to you, Matthias. Please. Yes, I just have to share my screen and then I'm with you uh, immediately. Um, okay. So I hope you can see my screen now. Yes. Perfect. So thank you, Jose. Thank you, Wolfgang, for inviting us uh, to this uh, very interesting and important meeting. And many thanks also to Leonard for framing very well uh, the, the context, the political and policy context in which we um, currently um, operate, um, with really the Green Deal being at the center of everything we do currently in the area of, of sustainability um, at the European Commission. Um, the Green Deal is really the, the political commitment and, and the objective that we have set uh, for, for this commission, um, but it is a commitment and objective only. It requires um, measures to achieve these objectives. And these measures, and uh, Leonard has mentioned many of them, um, is what we have developed in the last one and a half years, uh, be it the farm to fork uh, strategy, be it the circular economy action plan, the sustainable, um, or the, the um, sustainable finance um, work we do. So these all these different strategies and action plans are all meant to uh, develop the proposals, the legislative or non-legislative proposals, which we would like to set in motion in order to achieve the objectives of the Green Deal. And one of these initiatives that, that, we, um, that, that we are proposing is the EU Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative. It is important um, um, because it is a horizontal initiative. That means it addresses responsible business conduct of European companies and their supply chains across all sectors. We have many more initiatives in, the, uh, in preparation which uh, equally try to enhance sustainability in global supply chains, but these look at specific aspects of the supply chain or specific sectors. For example, um, what um, Leonard already mentioned, the uh, deforestation-free supply chain proposal is one such specific proposal. We have a batteries regulation um, proposed just recently. So we are active in many fields. Um, with specific legislation, but um, let's say this these EU Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative is really the lex generalis above all of these initiatives to uh, actually um, provide a horizontal rule for companies across all sectors. So what is the, um, the rational and, and the objectives of this initiative? Our, our, let's say our intervention logic is that we started um, with the observation that there is unsustainable corporate governance practices that, that we have to address. They are there first because of a regulatory failure, because the, the voluntary standards that companies so far have applied to increase sustainability in their supply chains have not actually led to, to the, to the uh, systemic change that we need in order to address these, um, these uh, challenges in a, in a sustainable way. But there's also market failure um, because we see that, that companies are still uh, to, to a large extent focus on short-term financial value, that um, companies still continue to cause negative human rights and social and environmental impacts through their supply chains and that market prices indeed do not adequately reflect so these social and environmental costs. So we come up with, with um, that, that leads us to, to the specific objectives of this initiative, which is uh, that um, we, on the one hand, uh, uh, think that there has to be action on uh, enabling directors of companies to establish longer time horizons in their decision making and really take sustainability into account in their core decision making, and that we want to help reduce adverse human rights and environmental impacts um, 
in line with EU goals, but also in line with uh, international standards uh, like the OECD guidance or the UN guiding principles. And the further objective is that, that we think uh, European legislation is, uh, is relevant in this uh, regard because we need a level playing field across European member states so that the same rules on corporate sustainability uh, apply across our member states and that there's also certainty for companies about their obligations and the liabilities they face. So that led us to the proposal of this sustainable corporate governance initiative, which actually has two parts. Um, on the one hand, we have the director's duty part, which uh, um, addresses the, the problem that, that still at director level, corporate strategies often focus more on short-term uh, financial uh, and uh, shareholder objectives rather than long-term um, interests of a company's entire stakeholders and also the environment and uh, and of course also a cap, um, climate change objectives. Um, then as part of that, we also um, want to address uh, the, the, uh, the fact that, that currently director's remuneration is mostly um, oriented at shareholder value and uh, does not yet take into account a company's sustainability performance. And the second part of this initiative is that uh, we want to introduce a mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence duty for European companies and their global supply chains. And this is actually the core of what I would like to talk today uh, to you about, uh, and which is also actually what Germany has uh, just now um, um, adopted with their uh, um, supply chain law. So our initiative, uh, because it contains the director's duty part, is a bit larger, but uh, at the core of it, and uh, what is most interesting for, for also for companies from the uh, coffee sector, is, is this due diligence duty part, because that actually provides uh, or um, uh, contains requirements uh, for companies to exercise mandatory due diligence along their supply chain. And finally, the impacts that we hope to see with this initiative is on the company level, a more in com uh, improved competitiveness and resilience of companies. Um, we want to, or we aspire for um, improved um, uh, and well-being of stakeholders along global value chains. We think the economy itself can benefit from uh, increased innovation that such an initiative can actually trigger, but also more resilience and competitiveness of our companies. And uh, we see benefits for society as a whole to contribute with this initiative to the sustainability transition. And last but not least, and this is the most important part for us at DG um, International um, Partnerships, uh, that we really uh, aspire for positive impact of this initiative for our developing partner countries in terms of um, adverse human rights and environmental impacts being reduced and, and addressed by companies. So where do we stand with, with the implementation uh, of this initiative? We have started in um, early uh, uh, 2020 with the publication of two major studies which we had commissioned uh, to provide the evidence that uh, we need. Matthias. Yes. Sorry, but we see some black boxes on the screen. We don't see that properly. Yeah. Is it gone now? No, we see um, the slide, uh, but it's powered one, up. One, one went, yes. Okay. Now we lost your your screen entirely. Otherwise, I can share. Yes. I have. Yes, Amanda. If you if you have it open, please uh, can you pop up yours and uh, Matthias just uh, indicate to Amanda when you want to move on. Yes, just one second. Yeah, it just got out and now it's back in, Matthias. It's joining again. Okay. We have Matthias back. Yes, Amanda, please unmute, unmute him. He can't unmute himself. Yes. You have to make him co-host again. Okay. 
Okay, sorry, that was the wrong button, obviously. Uh, let's try to share again. We, we can share ourselves if you like. Uh, yeah, but then you don't have the, um, well, you do have the presentation, but it's easier. Uh, give me a chance to, to try it again. If it doesn't work, sure. then, then indeed I take your. Of course. Um, So what can you see now? You can can you see the slide now or? Yeah, uh, yeah. it's in uh, it's not in uh, presentation mode. Okay, but no, it, this is then not the wrong slide. Oh, but the the black uh, the black box appeared again at the top. Yeah. That's a pity. Um, what can we do about it? I mean, if you have the presentation, then then indeed yeah. you you can can share it, and I just tell you to move okay. on. Okay. Yeah, Amanda, please do the yeah. honors. Are you able to see it? Just uh, the, not the presentation, but the, uh, your, your, oh, I don't know what it is, the, the manager, the file manager program. Have to select the right screen. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. There we yes. go. Okay, great. So we go one step further to the next slide. Okay, perfect. So and sorry again for the interruption. So I said that uh, in order to develop this initiative, we started with commissioning two studies to provide the evidence uh, for our uh, legislative work. And one was the study on due diligence in requirements uh, throughout the supply chain, which actually contained a large scale survey among companies to identify um, how many companies actually voluntarily apply um, standards on uh, sustainability and due diligence systems along their supply chain. And the reason, uh, the, the result was actually that that for less than 20% actually do on a regular basis. Um, the, the second study we commissioned was on the director's duty part of the initiative, which um, had been launched in June uh, last year. Then just please click one, one more. Then we had started in October last year um, a big public consultation, which actually received record uh, response rates uh, with uh, 855 um, full responses by different uh, types of stakeholders and actually 400, uh, more than four, four, almost 500,000 uh, reactions. Although these contain a large number of uh, reactions actually from campaigns by CSOs who have used the same um, submission and, and uh, actually reinforced that by submitting it uh, um, a, a high number of times. Um, then, um, but what, what this consultation uh, showed that was that we indeed uh, see wide recognition, both uh, for um, the need to have a, a legislative action on director's duty, but also on a mandatory uh, due diligence <laughs> obligation for companies. Please click. The next step in the legislative, pro legislative process um, or actually accompanied to accompanying it uh, has been council conclusions uh, by member states um, uh, under German presidency uh, adopted in uh, December uh, of last year, which give the EU a clear mandate uh, to, uh, or the commission, a clear mandate to, to prepare this proposal. Um, the, these council conclusions call for a mandatory due diligence obligation, um, a coherent and aligned with the UN guiding principles and also the OECD guidance on due diligence. They also call on the EU to launch an action plan um, uh, to uh, shape global supply chains more sustainably. This is actually an element uh, which, uh, as Jose had called this, the smart mix um, of regulatory uh, measures uh, combined with, uh, with more market-based measures and, and uh, other types of support. So in this action plan, we understand this to, um, um, to, to uh, 
a call on us to go beyond regulatory action, but also accompany this um, this legislative proposal uh, and with um, sufficient support to companies and our partner countries so that implementation is actually um, leading to the benefits that, that we want to see. And then finally, the council conclusion contained a call on us to update our last uh, communication on decent work um, for all, which we actually now working on. Next, please. Um, and at the same time, the European Parliament had issued two uh, reports uh, that, that uh, somehow give their position on, um, on this topic. Uh, one report uh, which covered the director's duty part of our proposal was the Durand report, which uh, has been adopted by the European Parliament in December last year. Uh, the second report was the Volta's report, which actually addresses the, the mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence obligation. Um, both actually the Volta's report and the Council conclusions um, call on the EU to um, adopt uh, mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence for companies and their supply chains. And both actually also call on us to extend this obligation to non-European companies who import products on the European market. This last point is actually one which we have not so far considered in our proposal um, because we have taken company law as the basis of, of this proposal. And this is more a measure which would be in trade policy. So we have to see how that can be addressed. But I mention it because this is uh, an element uh, that, that where actually the Council and the Parliament uh, goes beyond the ambition that we currently have. And then one more click, please. We um, are now at the phase of the legislative or of the, of the lawmaking process um, that we have uh, finalized an impact assessment, which is a very important step um, of our internal work on this initiative, where we actually um, uh, address uh, the cost and benefits that several options uh, of going about this proposal have. And uh, the, the outcome of this uh, impact assessment is actually a decision on the most preferred option that we would then take and pursue um, in, in the legislative text that we are now starting to, to draft. So this step here has taken a bit longer than, than, than originally planned, which also meant that the entire legislative process has been extended. So we uh, originally um, at, at intended to uh, have the final legislative proposal ready by June this year. It will now be uh, more towards the end of the year, but um, this is not uh, for us, not a major issue. It is rather um, a demonstration of the fact that we really take this serious and really want to work out all um, uh, all um, uh, points that, that are necessary to be addressed in order to come up with a workable and, and feasible and, and also wide ranging uh, proposal. Last click, please. So that leads us then now with a view into the future. Um, we, we still aim for adoption of this initiative uh, um, by October or, or at least in the, sec uh, in, the, in the last quarter of this year. Um, this will be then the adoption of our proposal. We will present this proposal then to the Parliament and the European Council. And it is then at the side of the European Council and member states to, to further discuss it. Uh, this may take some time um, and uh, certainly um, will, will extend far into 2020. Until then, um, we actually have um, um, hopefully then by um, a, an adopted um, a or a decision adopted by member states and the outcome will actually be a directive. So this directive will then have to be transposed into the national law of all our member states, which will again uh, take um, a, a few years uh, to, to be put in place. And this is important time that we actually um, consider to use well uh, by um, building at that time the necessary accompanying support measures that we think are necessary uh, to, to help companies and our partner countries um, make uh, and adapt and, and implement this, this legislation in the best possible way. Next slide, please. Which actually leads me to talk a bit about the accompanying support, which, uh, which is the main um, interest uh, the, and, and, uh, and also object or task that, that uh, DG International Partnership has in this proposal. You, you may know development cooperation 
policy does not has a mandate to uh, adopt legal proposals. Um, that that is indeed uh, um, in the case of this EU Sustainable Corporate Governance Initiative uh, with DG Just and uh, since recently also uh, DG Grow. Uh, they are the ones who lead on this pr proposal. But DG Inpa uh, has a very important role to actually ensure that this legislative proposal has positive impact uh, also outside Europe on our developing partner countries. And our position is, and this is widely acknowledged, uh, that the law itself will not achieve the systemic, the systemic impact that, that we want to see. But we have indeed to accompany this law with um, appropriate measures uh, that, um, that actually uh, uh, complement the regulatory work with market-based and, and non-regulatory initiatives uh, to help um, make this, uh, this um, uh, legislation really be effective and achieve its objective. And with a view to developing countries, that means actually that, that we cannot take for granted that, that adopting the legislation alone will immediately lead companies to do a type of due diligence that actually benefits producer countries. Uh, we can also, the way we clearly see that there's a risk that companies may disengage from very risky places, from very risky sectors, or from very risky suppliers, and will thereby potentially harm those producers and, small, and particularly small scale, small scale farmers, uh, informal workers, uh, artisanal miners, all those uh, upstream parts of, um, uh, of the supply chain, which are most vulnerable, which are also most um, exposed to human rights uh, risks along the supply chain. So if we see companies disengage from them, then the consequence would be lost livelihoods for these uh, populations. And this is absolutely not what we want. So therefore, uh, we see um, a clear role uh, to accompany this law with the right support to enable companies uh, to in a meaningful way, engage with the supply chain and introduce due diligence, uh, not as a tick boxing exercise, not as something which they do on paper, but really something which they do by reaching out to their stakeholders in the field, working together with producers on increasing sustainability in their supply chain. So we can click um, a couple of times, or may, yeah, maybe we go one by one. Um, what these accompanying measures include um, are on the one hand uh, that we see there has to be guidance um, on specific aspects of the legislation. The legislative proposal we intend to adopt will only provide a framework. It will tell companies what they have to do, but not exactly how they have to achieve that. So they will say, you have to um, introduce systems of due diligence, you have to identify and mitigate uh, risks along your supply chain, but how companies are doing that is not actually uh, spelled out in the in the legislation itself, but there uh, we have to um, to issue guidance that help companies uh, to, to see what, what's actually required from them in order to be compliant with the law. And a very important um, Reference in this case is the OECD guidance on due diligence to which we will also make reference and which is also what um, um, an important standard to which we align our legislative work. So here uh, companies, uh, where even if we cannot uh, um, uh, provide any uh, indication of what exactly will be in our proposal, uh, it will certainly um, uh, be aligned with the OECD guidance and also the United Nations guiding principle on business and human rights. So what's in there will also be um, supported by, by the EU um, directive. The next uh, click, please. Uh, we think that uh, collaborative uh, action and stakeholder engagement is important to make um, this, this due diligence really um, beneficial for partner countries and, and their producers. Uh, so this is um, a lot of actually um, the, I think the um, International Coca, um, uh, the International Coffee Association and, um, and your, your task force is a perfect example for such uh, collective action uh, where um, uh, public sector, private sector, NGOs, um, um, meet and, and uh, together uh, develop measures uh, in order to increase sustainability uh, along a supply chain. So this is something we also intend to support. Um, then please one click more. Uh, a very important uh, element, which is actually at the core of what, what DG International Partnerships is doing with our development cooperation, is producer capacity building. Um, uh, we see um, the, the examples that um, uh, that Leonard mentioned on the for our sustainable coca initiative um, have elements of uh, direct support to producers in the, the 
uh, cocoa producing countries. So this is an example, but we have more such um, uh, activities already in place now, and we plan to do more. For example, we have calls for proposals, uh, for example, through the switch program, um, but also for um, in Latin America through the Al Invest Verde program, which actually um, issue calls for proposal where um, business intermediaries, NGOs, companies uh, can propose uh, can submit proposals that we fund uh, um, to in order to pilot uh, innovative projects that lead to more sustainable production practices that lead to a better risk assessment of supply uh, of risks along supply chains and so forth. One more click, please. Then we have the support to partner country governments, which is again at the core of what DG International Partnerships is doing. Um, um, so our bilateral co development cooperation with partner countries will, um, in this current um, um, multi-annual financing framework, see a lot of actions where we actually support partner country governments, for example, to uh, transform into national law core labor standards so that, that companies uh, have a, cert a legal certainty uh, or investors also have a legal certainty when operating in these countries about what standards are applicable. And, and we are of an interest that these standards uh, are there and, and lead uh, to more responsible business conducts in these in our partner countries themselves. Next click, please. We have we see a need for um, continuing um, uh, our engagement at global level in, um, uh, in commodity bodies like the International Coffee um, um, Coffee Organization, but also at the level of, of the OECD, for example, where we fund a lot of, of important work on responsible business conduct that the Europe OECD is doing. Uh, we see that our European proposal um, has is only an intermediate step to actually achieving an international level playing field. So we have a strong interest to see the standards that we now impose on European companies to be um, further adopted by other countries uh, outside Europe uh, so that we at the end have an international playing field where the same high standards on sustainability apply not only to European companies but also to their international competitors. And final point, last click please. That's uh, what we also consider important, and this is not only DG INPA doing this, but also other DG uh, Commission uh, Director Generals. We need to work with the consumers in Europe to explain why sustainability is important, why sustainability has a price, and why um, why we need to, um, together with, um, with, with, uh, with, the, with the citizens of Europe, actually um, work towards uh, a mitigation of risks uh, in our partner countries along global supply chains. And this is uh, a final important element that we consider accompanying um, measure to this EU legislation which we are currently working on. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, it uh, is quite a complicated process in a sense, but I think uh, we are there for you in case you have questions uh, and, and do our best to answer them. Thank you very much. Wolfgang, I don't know how much regarding time, but basically what, what Matthias said is the landing of all this is in our programming, as I said, um, we have around 80 billion of programming of which 60 billion go to the geographicals, uh, meaning uh, the Africa's, the Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Africa has 29 billion. Um, and actually with dialogues and discussions with the partner countries, with stakeholders, um, the ball will now be at, at country level in, in terms of how, for example, an EU Green Deal or a Team Europe, meaning European Union, with a number of member states who want to be transformative of, on a number of value chains, this will mean that any regulatory or transformative approach of changes can actually be engaged so that these accompanying measures that Matthias mentioned can actually also be win-win from the farmers to the youth to the women-led organizations in a truly transformative way. We need to start showing, and it's important with ICO, uh, with, with, uh, with the coffee producers, to start showing across the value chain impact. If we don't show impact, the issue of consumer willingness to pay for social and environmental standards will not penetrate. This is the work we are doing also on COCO. Are consumers willing to pay an extra premium price to have higher standards? And that is, I think, a question that also needs to be discussed within the task force 
Um, otherwise, it's, it will not make sense for consumers to pay that extra premium price. In cocoa, it's a small component of the total chocolate bean. Uh, in the case of coffee, um, I, don't, I haven't seen any studies showing this willingness to pay, but uh, it's through the consumer-led agenda that we can also show that uh, the price signals to the final consumer, to the final uh, farmer can actually also uh, translate itself into higher prices uh, at farm level so that there are truly high standards on human rights and also on the ferrostation free value chains. Over to you. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, and uh, a special thank you, Matthias. Uh, uh, you made a very complex uh, uh, issue appear, I wouldn't say simple, but um, it's intelligible uh, to, to uh, us uh, mortals. Um, before I open the floor for q and I'd like just, uh, Amanda, if you can go back to today's agenda. Uh, I, I think we had uh, several uh, participants that joined us uh, uh, late, and I just wanted, they, they may have been expecting to see the presentation on Germany. And just by way of uh, explanation, let me tell you that the speaker from Germany had uh, health issues uh, right uh, at a, a very late stage. Uh, she cannot be present today and uh, nobody else was uh, available to take her place. So we will, um, we will uh, uh, arrange another opportunity to look at uh, the German uh, initiative. Now, uh, so today's uh, uh, agenda is uh, shortened. We will go into a Q&A session now. Then we will have uh, some uh, uh, reaction, some feedback uh, from uh, three uh, important uh, uh, members uh, 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 of the coffee value chain. Uh, uh, another Q and A session, and then we will close. The 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 one good thing about the absence of uh, the German speaker is now we have uh, we are not uh, so uh, tied down uh, to uh, deadlines, but. Let's keep the ball rolling. And um, I, I, we've uh, started to receive, oh, please, Amanda, uh, why don't you go through the housekeeping notes for people to make interventions during this uh, question and answer session? Sure, thank you very much, Jose. Let me open my camera so I can. Okay, so as this is a webinar style event, you can see that all participants are muted except from the host and the speakers. So if you would like now to make a verbal intervention uh, during, during this session, uh, you can click on reaction. You can see the image right on your um, screen and press raise hand. And then uh, the host, so Jose will give you the floor and I will make sure to unmute you. And uh, written questions can also be sent by text to International Coffee Organization and I'll forward them to Jose. Um, and yes, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, please uh, uh, stick up your virtual hand uh, if you have uh, questions. And I have already two questions by the chat function. So let me start with uh, those. Um, the first is uh, a question to, to Matthias, uh, and it gets uh, right down to the nitty gritty. Uh, I think uh, you mentioned uh, at some point in your presentation that there would be grants available uh, to, to help uh, put all of uh, this into action. Uh, is there, uh, the question, is there a web page where these grants are published and uh, can be accessible to all? Well, I wish I could say yes, there's a web page where, where all of that could be found just uh, really um, uh, made accessible uh, on this particular topic. But unfortunately, um, and we are not at the stage yet where we, uh, where we uh, can, can pull all these different activities together in a way 
to to present them, um, in, let's say, in a one-stop shop. Um, because what we do um, is at or what we what's available right now is. Um, activities that have been in place even before we started work on this legislative proposal. It's because we, of course, see that that sustainability along supply chains, that uh, sustainable production practices are important and are not only important since we work on this proposal. So at the moment, uh, we have to um, um, direct you to the to the known channels uh, for example the switch program has its websites where you can see regularly calls being published um, the all invest uh, verde program for latin america has its its um, um, usual um, channels through which these proposals are published already since years and we will continue to use them for these programs uh, we we will in the future uh, we do aspire in the future to be to to increase transparency and clarity on on the particularly the new actions that we plan and that also, by the way, our member states are, are um, planning and, and uh, in, in many cases doing them together with us in a Team Europe um, approach. So um, at the moment, um, what's out there already um, has to go through the known channels. And the most important one is, is actually the website where you can find tenders and call for proposals, um, where all these programs are actually accessible as soon as there's a call. Um, but um, for the future, um, we may indeed uh, try to, to be more transparent and, and pull them all at one place so that they are even more uh, transparent. Thank you, Matthias. And the second question is, is uh, related. Um, uh, it asks uh, uh, who will be issuing these uh, calls for proposals and also who can apply for them, if it's uh, NGOs or private sector, both, uh, um, please. Well, if they relate to, to sustainability along global supply chains, it will, of course, be the stakeholders along the supply chains, uh, mostly as it is now for the Al Invest Verde program, for example, and also Switch Asia. It can be business intermediaries or multi-stakeholder initiatives. What's important is that, that it's not uh, only companies, um, and particularly not for, for initiatives or projects which are profit-making. So what we want to see is pre-competitive collaboration, is a testing of innovative, of new ideas, which then can then once once they have been kickstarted with our grant support can then be uh, put to market and, and scaled up uh, through the through the private sector without our support so this is the intention so therefore it's often um, uh, required and beneficial if uh, if um, non-profit making partners or business associations or ngos are part of, of the um, proposal thank you matthias um, also, also, it's important yeah. that colleagues uh, across the globe are in periodic contact with our delegations. There is, uh, there, there are communication uh, or uh, information um, colleagues in delegations. Most of the activity is at country level. So if it's in Rwanda or if it's in Kenya, it will be happening in Rwanda and Kenya, unless they are global calls, which will then be uh, announced within a global call. And I think it's also the role of ICO, maybe, that at one point in time, we sort of go through the labyrinth, because it is a labyrinth of how to um, tap into funding, and um, both direct funding, which goes to NGOs, to uh, civil society organizations, there are targeted calls, um, but also, for example, in blending operations, um, if there are bankable projects, which could be going through um, a, a financial institution, these are also fundable uh, through, for example, we have Agrify and through EFAD, um, for example, because we have also um, have the ABC fund, which has a, a portfolio for small ticket sizes of below 1 million. So I think there is um, a different schemes according to the different requirements of sustainability. And it is important that uh, once we see the requests or once through ICO, um, there could be a clearing house of information, we can direct them on also the timing of future calls once they come into STEAM at country level or at global level. Thank you, Leonard. Um, I have some more questions on the chat function, but I also have one. Uh, with us, uh, uh, Rick, uh, Rick Reinhardt, please, uh, you have the floor. Not certain if I'm unmuted, but uh, if I yes, am. We, we hear you, we hear you. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much uh, for the presentation uh, and 
for some of the insights that revealed themselves there. Uh, in, in particular, the, the observation that this kind of work frequently has unintended consequences, and it's um, reassuring to note that that is front and center on your minds. In that same vein, I, I, I wonder if it uh, has been a, a topic of some conversation internally for you about um, providing a mechanism to create um, legislative and regulatory alignment between producer and consumer states. Uh, in, insofar as um, this kind of strategy for implementing uh, a, a market um, compatible strategy for pursuit of more sustainable uh, value chains, I think it's clear that there's a necessity for both a push and a pull within that value chain. The, the analog from the legislative and regulatory side would, I presume, be good alignment between the regulatory environment at the producer level and the regulatory environment at the consumer level. Have you provided for a, an engagement or a series of engagements, a, a uh, informed discussion or in, in any way or any mechanism for aligning those regulatory environments um, so that there's a a greater harmony in approach to um, how these commodities reach the marketplace. And as a, co a corollary to that, is there a role for ICO um, as, a, as an engager of the public sector um, in the presence of the private sector? Is there a role for ICO to help facilitate that kind of um, creativity around legislative and regulatory progress from the producer side as well? Who wants to take that one, Leonard or? I, I, I can take it. Yes. We, have, we haven't done anything on coffee, to be honest. We are trying to do it on cocoa, as I mentioned earlier on. Why? Because there has been a process. First of all, Rick, uh, this has to be sort of pilot tested in a few countries, which are manageable in terms of size and in terms of what I call global coverage. Um, engaging with Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and Cameroon, basically within the EU, gives us traction of around two thirds of the market where we source our cocoa beans. So there is, since last year, we have been having what are known as cocoa talks, discussions on what you are saying, producer led, country driven, government driven agendas calibrated through. Uh, the regulatory approaches that we will come um, and which will impact the cocoa value chain. Um, are we in a position to do the same for coffee? Premature because uh, dealing with coffee is much more complicated than dealing with cocoa because of the um, uh, structure of the market. Um, if it works in cocoa and we can show that there could be returns because there is the buy-in, for example, there is the buy-in of the governments of Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana on deforestation, on, on uh, landscaping of what needs to be done on deforestation free value chains, on human rights, on education in terms of child labor issues. If that can be shown and there is a living income differential, which is then transformed into uh, living incomes to uh, small farm holders, um, and this is linked also to a holistic approach of food systems thinking, including research, including social protection, including the education dimension. Because what we are trying to do is a holistic approach. Um, the instrument we have, which is called the neighborhood um, uh, program, uh, which is, is also on, uh, on uh, this 80 billion portfolio, um, has a number of targets. 30% has to be climate, around 20% has to be human development, 10% migration. We have a number of targets to deliver also to our taxpayers and to the uh, interinstitutional aspects. What we need to show is that what we are doing has an impact on the ground, as I said. So what we are trying to do with cocoa can be at the right moment emulated to coffee and linking the various operators across the value chain. But we haven't started it. We, we started it with the um, uh, international organization equivalent of ICO for COCO, 
Uh, maybe when the right time is ripe, uh, we can start with Jose, but the complexity of COPO is much more than two or three countries where we are sourcing our um, raw material. Matthias, I don't know whether you want to add anything from a more legislative uh, dimension. Well, to one remark on alignment, perhaps, uh, because alignment concerns us most um, when it comes to alignment with international standards, but also alignment with existing private sector um, um, sustainability initiatives. There has been a question accidentally, obviously, uh, posted only to me personally, but uh, what is the role of uh, private ethical sustainability uh, schemes in this process? And indeed, uh, we, we, of course, do not want to make them redundant, much in the contrary. They will continue to have a role, and because we try to align as much as possible with the same international standards towards uh, to which also these schemes um, adhere to, um, they, they will be relevant as instruments for companies to actually um, bring into practice the type of systems and, and activities that, that the law will require. So to meet the requirements of the law, um, a private sustainability scheme can be a, an effective way to put that into practice. So there is no, um, there, there's a strong complementarity here and, and um, we, we seek alignment uh, with, with the existing schemes and standards in order to, uh, to keep the existing um, private and voluntary schemes, um, of course, fully into the, into the market. Thank you, Matthias. Now, uh, my colleague Gerardo Pataconi has a question. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Jose and uh, Leonard, Matthias, and all, all, all of you to be in here. I mean, it, it's, it's very interesting and, and, and we're very, uh, very glad that this is opportunity offered by the ICO and through the, the task force. And I have three three points I'd like to we have some clarification. One, of course, um, uh, you as EU are you are very much engaged with Javier in in the task force, and you know that that is a, this is a platform that would facilitate this process in the sense that we have the luxury of having uh, sitting at the same table both industry and and government. So. I believe that this uh, platform should be uh, maybe also used in this context, um, not only to, to participate uh, and to listen, but then to be proactive and maybe uh, leapfrog on, on the possibility to do something more specific for coffee. My second point is with regard to what uh, Rick was saying. Um, uh, I, I believe that one of the key points of his uh, statement is that the, uh, the level of producing countries, uh, the, this new uh, directive, when this will be uh, approved and discussed also, I believe, at the WTO, so without creating possible uh, obstacle to trades, may need or may uh, uh, be considered for adoption within the, the legislative framework. If this is something that, as uh, as the Commission, you would consider, I'm not talking about the actual implementation, but I'm not talking about at the level of legislation. Do you think that that should be a process in that respect, or the directive the EU have an impact? Producers and industry will solve it. And my third point is related again with what Leonard say, and to put all this together. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, the complexity of uh, working with the different uh, um, portfolio of funding opportunity by the EU. Um, you know, for, as you know, from also my personal experience, Laura, Laura knows, uh, I think what is, would be interesting to, uh, to, to pick up on Leonard to say, can we uh, organize as kind of a seminar workshop for our members to understand how to approach the delegations in the countries. A number of uh, the, 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 the ICO stakeholders, they, they don't know, they're not directly related to the Minister of Planning or with the contact with delegations. So my, my suggestion, I don't know if that is possible to organize in the near future, uh, also within the ICO and the task force, a sort of a briefing to explain what to be done. Because we've been talking about that and we know that there are in significant progress, but these resources, in order to uh, to make a disposal of our members, I think we need some facilitation, but also to present how to do it. 
and and this is I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias Leonard. Uh, Matthias, do you want to speak about the WTO compatibility and the dimension of uh, um, how do we reconcile the impact? Because whatever we will do, even in deforestation free value chains or organic regulation, whatever is done at EU level will have an impact. And that is also what we are doing with our delegations is to communicate. Um, it's not a question of mitigating the impact or compensating, but uh, as, as Matthias was saying, is accompanying a process of transformative change. Uh, this will happen, whether we like it or not, it will happen, our political masters, also because we want to show leadership on climate neutrality across the board, on biodiversity, because it's nice to speak about biodiversity around climate change, but then you have also to show what are the instruments, what are the tools. A pure voluntary approach or a pure private approach has not worked in terms of transformation. It has not always worked. Hence, kicking in of a regulatory approach, which will have to be coexistence with uh, private standard setting where they are working, because in some cases they are working. Um, so it, the, the question of WTO compatibility is, is not going to be contested. We will not propose anything uh, which is not WTO compatible. But I think what is important, and this is part of what we are doing in the dialogues of pathways of the food systems is that like cocoa, like palm oil, I would like to see more engagement at country level on coffee value chains. I don't have much traction about coffee value chains compared to other value chains in a number of countries. For example, Gerard and Jose, you know, in a few months time, we will have a new Africa summit. Is there appetite from the African side to have something around coffee value chains? Because there might be on cocoa, but I don't see much on coffee. So it is all a question of prioritization. We, we can't come with 14 value chains or 20 value chains of which coffee is one. We either prioritize or not. We can't, as, as my bosses tell me, we can't solve all the problems around the globe. We need to be targeted, we need to prioritize. The question is, in a country setting, is coffee being prioritized or not? If it's prioritized, then let us work around it and see what are the accompanying measures with all the ammunition, because it's not a question of blending or innovative finance, which, which will make the, the change. It has to be budget support. It has to be agricultural research. It has to be social protection. So it, it's, it's, it's a whole range of measures. But uh, Matthias, if you want maybe to elaborate more on this uh, legal dimension, well, on WTO, I think you have said everything that can be said at this stage. Um, what, what I may want to add is uh, indeed on the accompanying support. Uh, this is not all about funding um, company proposals uh, only. I think what we see our role much more important, actually, because that comes from the challenge of this, this uh, legislation. We legislate within the European Union for European companies, but this legislation has impact on the entire supply chain extending far outside the European Union. So we actually legislate into, um, into situations where we have no legislative power. So what we do with our accompanying support or what we aspire to do is to work with our partner countries to actually get the local and uh, national legislation right so that companies will not um, actually be seen themselves in a situation where European law requires something from them, what the national legislation where, where the producers operate is actually absent. So here we, for example, um, will invest a lot into um, bringing labor standards into national legislation and creating the, the enforcement capacity that is needed, labor inspections and so forth, to actually make them applicable in our partner countries. That again helps companies who operate there to refer to, to the national legislation of the partner country and thereby immediately also comply with what we require them to do through the due diligence legislation. So this is um, an important pillar of our accompanying support as well, which may not translate into grants to companies or to multi-stakeholder initiatives, but which is in our view equally important to help companies make sense out of the legislative proposal that we are working on. Thank you, Matthias. Um, we uh, are uh, 
experiencing some time uh, timing issues, um, uh, I would uh, like to move on now to our uh, panel. Uh, after that, we will have, uh, depending on the time available, a little more space for question and answer. Meanwhile, all the questions that you have submitted uh, by chat, we will forward them uh, to uh, Matthias and Leonard, and uh, we hope to reply uh, in writing at a later date. So um, let's move on to the views from uh, uh, the people, uh, uh, stakeholders and others involved uh, in uh, the coffee trade. And uh, we'll start with uh, Santiago Arguello of uh, Mexico. He's the Director General of Agricultural Promotion at the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, Santiago, please, your reactions. Thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or evening to all the audience that accompanies us today. And uh, yes, uh, on behalf of the government of Mexico and our Secretary of Agriculture, Victor Lobos, I want to thank to our Executive Director of the ICO, Mr. Sete and Wolfgang, a coordinator of this uh, coffee public private task force for this opportunity to share the point of view of an uh, important country, an exporting country that vein the cradle of initiatives and different production systems in coffee, such as organic, biodynamic, fair trade. Uh, we really celebrate those regulatory trends and developments for this uh, aromatic supply chain. And I think uh, during the last 20 years, uh, there is a lot of progress, but we recognize that uh, there is definitely a lot of work yet to be done related to this. Uh, we see as a country and region from a cafe, uh, some challenges, but also opportunities that we would like to share today. So uh, first of all, uh, in terms of uh, R&D, uh, I'm agree it's a great opportunity to define a uh, joint agenda and co-investment in public-private debate, in innovations to improve productivity, resilience, and profitability in this important productive chain at origin, and make together a climate smart coffee growing. That's that's very important. Second, uh, in terms of logistics and trade, uh, we think that the uh, with the new reality after COVID-19 that we live in all over the world, uh, those regulatory trends has to be accompanied uh, with governmental initiatives uh, to efficient logistics and facilitate the commercial exchange with the European Union through the mechanisms of equivalence of standards and certifications, uh, also digitalization of procedures and greater traceability from the MATA to the COP in compliance with those regulatory trends that we respectfully think it must be gradual, visible, transparent, and auditable for all parties involved in, in, in and interested in this supply, sustainability of this supply chain. Uh, on the other hand, uh, labor rights at the farm level will be strengthened. Uh, and this is essential in agri-food systems for the future sustainability and not, not only in the coffee supply chain, but in all production chains, since uh, agricultural laborers and their families are essential for the sustainability and to keep quality of the coffee production in the world. That's, it's very important. Uh, 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 in terms of finance and capex uh, for origin, we are clear that it will require investments in public and private goods and services in origin. And we recognize many European and German companies are, are already, respons in, already responsibly investing, not only to improve the, their productivity of their suppliers, producers, but in other investments that will also be necessary to improve the level of well-being of the producers, families, and agricultural workers in different coffee growing regions in the world. 
So as a government of Mexico, uh, we invite the roasters and importing companies that are committed uh, with this, uh, with this uh, trend, uh, regulatory trends to review together the current baseline, baseline of performance related uh, and define together the CAPEX proposals needed in a public private way to improve the level of sustainability uh, together. So uh, finally, uh, to say that uh, these regulatory trends represent an opportunity as well to increase the responsible consumption of coffee. Uh, we did uh, the prosperous income of coffee producers' families. That's very important in the different regions for this aromatic in the world. So we have no doubt that the cons consumers uh, will continue to value this joint effort made by producers in exporting countries and companies in importing countries that will, with the help of a legislative help at destiny, but also at origin that is needed, will increase uh, with a sense of urgency based on those important regulatory trends. So uh, just to, to, to finalize, I uh, invite you to work together, not only on those regulatory trends, but for the human rights and sustainability of this important coffee production chain. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago. And uh, then let's move uh, to the Secretary General of the European Coffee Federation, uh, Eileen Gordon. I uh, admire Eileen greatly because uh, she has to reconcile uh, a lot of uh, uh, conflicting or differing interests, let's say, uh, uh, traders, roasters, uh, warehouse uh, 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 operators, uh, uh, soluble. And um, I'm sure that uh, uh, this, uh, this presentation has raised a lot of uh, points uh, in her head. Eileen, uh, we're ready for you. Thank you so, so much, Jose. Uh, I really appreciate your introduction. And on this particular occasion, I don't think we have too much of an ordeal to find alignment because I think we all agree on the need of uh, complying with the sustainable value chain because it's in the best interest of us all. So here, I think for the first time, it's easy and we do have some sort of alignment. So firstly, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here to, to share your time this afternoon. Firstly, I would like to thank you, Jose, thank ICO for your great initiative to organize such a relevant webinar, to be able to discuss regulatory trends that have such a profound impact, as mentioned before, on the whole of the value chain. And we really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share our point of view with you. So just quickly to introduce who we are, who ECF is, the European Coffee Federation has been for the past 40 years, the umbrella organization of the European coffee trade and industry. We currently speak up for 15 national associations and 32 corporate members, representing a total import volume of 3 million tons or approximately 35% of the world coffee traded volume. So as ECF, we do welcome initiatives that aim to achieve meaningful progress on the social, economic and environmental challenges in the supply chains. The national initiatives and the upcoming uh, EU regulation that was so well defined and described today by, by Mr. Altman, all these new initiatives that are focusing on the due diligence and on sustainable corporate uh, governance, we really do believe they're a step in the right direction to be able to address human rights and environmental risks to make global supply chains much more resilient in the future. I do believe as well that as a coffee sector, we have already made really important efforts to improve the sustainability, the fairness and the transparency of the coffee supply chain. We believe, I believe that the private and public sectors have already undertaken important efforts on the ground to be able to uh, ensure the sustainability. However, we do also recognize that these voluntary approaches are not enough and we really they need to be complemented to be able to make significant change and to create an enabling environment an environment that uh, will allow the coffee industry to be able to prevent and to address human rights abuses and the environmental risks that are inherent to all uh, supply chains i think not only to to coffee 
However, we do also want to highlight that these regulatory approaches need to be thought through and pragmatic to be able to reach through three objectives. Before uh, starting this presentation, it was very clear in our mind what we needed, but after the presentation that Mr. Altman gave today, I think that many of our concerns have been addressed, and it's great to be, be able to see how with the um, impact assessment and the accompanying support that was proposed today, I do believe that we are aligned on what this EU approach should look like. So the three objectives that we were referring to would be in the first place, the need for the upcoming EU initiative to create a level play field, which has been mentioned. I think this is really important to have this level playing field across all the actors of the supply chain. The reason is because fragmented approaches make it really extremely difficult for international companies to be able to comply with the different legislations, and this can lead to unfair competition with countries having different standards. And at the end of the day, due diligence must be really harmonized. It's the same issue for everyone, so there should be a harmonization and that level playing field. On the second place, in the second place, I think the we believe the EU approach should be risk based and proportionate, as mentioned previously before. All companies should definitely observe due diligence, they should have due diligence requirements, but these should be proportionate to the capabilities of the company, in particular for SMEs. It also should be based on the severity of the risks. So therefore, it's very important to have clear definitions, clear criteria and clear methodologies. Uh, all this is really important from a legal perspective. We also think it's important to have transition periods that will enable companies sufficient time to be able to rethink or to strengthen their due diligence processes. Maybe what might be needed is soft and hard law instruments blending together in this smart mix that was referred to before by Jose that we believe is really appropriate. Now, how can we mix the, the, the initiatives that are already there with the new EU regulatory framework? And third, but not least, the EU approach, we believe, should integrate stakeholders' views, such as the, the view presented today by uh, Santiago. Thank you for giving that insight from uh, producing countries, because we really feel that it's so important to have these views to be able to find the right balance to be able to build a more resilient and sustainable supply chain. So the views of producing countries are extremely important. They definitely should be taken into consideration in all this uh, policy making process, as is being highlighted today in the presentation given by the European uh, Union. So we're very, very appreciative about that. So dialogue and partnerships with origin countries are definitely, as mentioned, key to be able to ensure that conditions are in place to achieve tangible impact globally in terms of governance, but also of law enforcement. So in all, and to wrap up, we believe that the EU approach needs to be harmonized so we can create this level playing field. It should be risk-based and proportionate and integrate all stakeholders' views to ensure that we really have an effective process or approach in place. So for this reason that now more than ever, we all really need to continue to work together so we may ensure the resilience of the coffee supply chain from farm to cup. We strongly believe that initiatives such as the ICO CPPTF are a very good example of collaboration as it offers this unique opportunity, a unique forum to be able to exchange impressions between the public and the private sector. And aware that we're very tight on, on time today, I just want to say that as ECF, we look forward to many more fruitful discussions as like the one we've had today. We continue open to collaboration and we wish you all uh, a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. And uh, our third panelist uh, is uh, Lisanne Van Beek, the Corporate Social Responsibility Advisor for the Center for, for the Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries of the Netherlands. Uh, Lisanne. Many thanks. Um, can I share my screen? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Can you see my presentation? It's okay. not in uh, yeah presentation mode. Yes, now it's good. exactly okay. Oh well, thank you very much. Um, 
especially for the ICO to, uh, to invite us to share our reflections uh, at this important and timely event. Um, my name is Lisanne van Beek. Um, I work as a corporate social responsibility advisor at CBI, um, the Center for the Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries. We are part of the Netherlands Enterprise Agency and commissioned by the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Our office is located in The Hague in uh, the Netherlands. Um, before I will share our reflections, I will briefly provide an explanation of our organization. Um, our mission is to support the transition towards inclusive and sustainable economies. Um, we do this by strengthening the economic, social and environmental sustainability of local SMEs through exports of value added services um, and products um, to European and regional markets. Um, thereby paying special attention to women and youth. And I'm very happy to have heard um, the topic of gender coming um, uh, in, this, in this session uh, already. Um, we take a systemic uh, approach, recognizing the complexity of the environment we work in and also looking further than symptoms uh, of issues, trying to address underlying causes of problems. And in terms of projects, um, I added a link to our website. Um, you can find uh, our projects, uh, and new, including new projects um, on this page. Um, oh yeah, just to mention that we work in over 30 countries um, and including um, uh, Africa and Asia. And we also have a project in Central America financed by the European Union. We have a coffee project in Rwanda, in Guinea, and in Central America. And until January of this year, uh, I was actually managing the co coffee um, project in Central America, in which we supported 25 SMEs in six Central American countries to become competitive on the European market. Um, on this slide, you will find our core competencies, uh, various levels, including SME level, consisting of individual expert coaching, matchmaking with international buyers, and enabling environment support. We also provide market information, um, over 250 market studies about trends and requirements on the European markets for our 14 focus sectors, including coffee. Uh, the studies are accessible on the website without any cost. And on this slide, I added the direct link to the market information on coffee. Related to the subject uh, on the agenda today, uh, I wanted to make a reference to the Coffee Barometer 2020, um, very comprehensive document, including challenges uh, at the producer level, uh, including uh, climate change, price development, uh, pressure to cut costs, uh, and uh, of course the pandemic um, exacerbating uh, the issues. Um, let me see in the chat, I see some, oh no. That's not for me, actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, in terms of um, the, the coffee barometer, it highlights the need for uh, collaborative action uh, in the coffee industry for an inclusive, resilient, and, um, and sustainable coffee sector. Then uh, the topic uh, of today uh, and our reflections, um, of course, um, much of this is anticipating since the, Ger the German and the European legislation uh, has not come into effect uh, yet. Um, but I included some of our thoughts, uh, mostly from the supplier perspective and also taking on a more practical uh, approach. Um, we, we certainly believe that the developments uh, we are talking about are important um, uh, as an important step towards addressing social and environmental issues. Um, we feel that it can create a push for more sustainable long-term relations between exporters and importers, moving from trust me to show me. Um, we hope that it uh, creates opportunities for suppliers, but at the same time, uh, we should also be careful for additional challenges. Um, for instance, in terms of dealing with a diverse set of due diligence procedures of buyers, um, which suppliers uh, have to deal with. Um, it also raises the questions uh, who pays for taking the, the necessary measures. Uh, and indeed, um, as has been said before, there might also be an implication for consumers uh, in terms of paying higher price. Um, it shows the importance of uh, CSR-related technical assistance. And at CBI, we raise awareness among uh, SMEs and business support organizations um, about uh, the developments. Uh, and also we provide uh, technical support um, 
uh, to address uh, CSR related risks, opportunities, and to comply with buyer uh, requirements. Uh, in view of the time, I only have two slides left. Just to provide you an example of our uh, coaching, um, we provide for um, SMEs as part of our projects. We, we, um, we work on a CSR roadmap uh, with them. Uh, this is a self-assessment uh, in which the companies need to define their uh, CSR risks and opportunities and also um, create a, an action plan and a code of conduct. And on our website, we also um, share the news article on the Hello, we lost your sound, Isan. Hello. Now it's back. Yes, sorry. Yes, uh, <laughs> I'm about to close. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, there's a lot more to talk about, of course, on this topic. And uh, in view of the time, I will stop here. Um, we follow the developments with great interest and many thanks again to the ICO and looking forward to uh, future discussions on, um, on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisanne. Um, let me put a, a, a take a advantage of my position here as a moderator and uh, put a question to Matthias, which I think uh, uh, it's not really my question, but uh, it was uh, touched upon by uh, yourself, Matthias, but, uh, but also by Santiago and uh, Lisanne, um, is the question of how how uh, we can make this uh, due diligence effective, but at the same time, take into account uh, the differing uh, uh, stages of uh, economic development uh, of uh, coffee producers. Um, I'm uh, especially uh, concerned, let's say, about uh, uh, that um, uh, this, uh, this type of arrangement would benefit uh, larger producers that uh, already uh, comply with many of, the, uh, of these uh, rules and uh, will kind of uh, uh, will not help uh, or even uh, make uh, uh, worse the situation of uh, small producers that do not have uh, all of this uh, background and power. Matthias. Well, thank you. Yes, uh, this is an important question indeed. And, uh, and as part of an answer, uh, it may help to, to confirm that, that we see due diligence as a continuous process of improvement. So it's not something everybody has to achieve at the same level at the same time, but it's really um, subject to capabilities and also to levels of risk. Uh, and here I'm with, with Aline that we need uh, proportionality, but not only um, proportionality to capabilities, but also proportionality to risks. Um, so this, this continuous improvement is uh, what, what we want companies to demonstrate. Uh, so if you are starting at a low capacity and, and have huge challenges ahead of you, then addressing these in a, in a, in a, process, in a continuous process is the right thing to do um, until we really reach over longer term than, than the level of sustainability we want to see. Um, the other part of the answer is, again, the accompanying support that we consider as important as the law itself. So through that, we actually try to to help those uh, weakest uh, parts of the supply chain, th those producers who may actually um, um, risk to uh, be negative effect negatively affected by that law to, to benefit from it as well. So this is uh, our clear and stated objective, in particular as DG International Partnerships, where we are responsible for international cooperation and partnerships and working with our partner countries uh, to, to help them in their development. This is our mandate, and this is why it's so important for us that uh, what our colleagues at the legislative side produce has positive impact for the um, countries with which we uh, work together in, in, uh, in, in our developing partner countries. Thank you. Uh, before I, I open the floor to more questions, uh, would you or, or Leonard have uh, more reactions to what our three panelists said? Well, I'm afraid Leonard had to leave sharp at, ah, okay. uh, at um, half uh, past four, so, so he might not even be with us anymore. But uh, basically, um, speaking to Aline already, um, I think we are, we are um, 
we are quite aligned. I'm happy to see the, the private sector being, uh, being itself conscious of, of the fact that we have to move beyond voluntary, um, um, which was echoed, of course, uh, uh, also um, uh, by, by, um, by Lisan. And uh, we, are, we are fully uh, behind that, that we value very much, by the way, the, the uh, strong engagement of the Netherlands and, and also Germany in, uh, in themselves engaging in, in providing the type of accompanying support that we think is needed. Uh, we have, by the way, seen um, uh, with the uh, conflict minerals regulation that is in, um, in, to enforce from the beginning of this year um, how well this can actually work. Um, the the, the uh, of conflict or responsible minerals regulation is actually the first EU regulation which adopts um, um, human um, uh, rights due diligence uh, to a particular sector in this case, but it's a very good case also to see um, how a horizontal um, due diligence obligation may unfold. Would anybody from the audience uh, like? Uh, otherwise, I, I have a, a bunch of questions uh, from the chat that are still left over and uh, could address. But uh, would anybody from the audience have more, or from the panelists, uh, um, have uh, a, something to say right now? Well, then Matthias, uh, I, I will uh, go back to some of the questions that were uh, previously raised. Now, uh, one of them is uh, very uh, to the point, I would say, and uh, uh, this is uh, what, uh, uh, what I have come to uh, expect from the private sector. And uh, the, the person says, uh, I did not get clarity about what exactly would be the content of the legislation slash regulation. What exactly would be included and how? Well, it's a perfect question, but I am in the same situation as, as the <laughs> colleague who's asking it, because as I said, we have not even started really working on the legal draft. We are at the stage of, of uh, finalizing the impact assessment. So what comes now is actually the work on the draft. Of course, um, the work we've done in the impact assessment gives us very clear guidance on uh, on the direction we want to take, but uh, it is too early now to to give a blueprint or to share a draft or to, show, to say anything specific about um, about what, what the final outcome will be. This is now the process we are into. And uh, it is actually also not the final result. I mean, the, it, what we will propose is a proposal. Um, um, it is a legislative proposal that goes to, to member states in the council and, and the parliament, and they will continue to discuss it. And they are the ones who finally have to adopt what will then become uh, legal obligations in all of our member states. Uh, so this is um, this is a process uh, which which we still have ahead of us, and uh, only at the end of this process do we really know what uh, what the outcome will be. Um, of course, what I said is the ambitions we have, um, and uh, here um, we we hope to, uh, to to be successful in implementing them. But uh, we we clearly. Um, value and, and, and take into account uh, the positions uh, that we have heard during the public consultation and that we continue to listen to um, uh, in, in this process uh, that, that come from all sides and um, that, that will also shape uh, this proposal. Okay, I have another question which uh, uh, in some ways is uh, similar, but it's uh, specific to the question of uh, uh, environment, uh, deforestation, and forest uh, degradation. So uh, the question is, um, uh, so the, the, it's another directorate that will be handling this uh, is uh, what I understand. But mm -hmm. they ask if you can elaborate uh, uh, a little more on the expected key pillars in that part of the, in the environmental part. Well, that is a difficult question too, because as you say, it is not our directorate who is leading on it, it's DG Environment. And uh, of course they work closely with us in particular also because this uh, deforestation free um, supply chain um, initiative will um, to some extent uh, substitute elements of the um, flecked and um, uh, timber regulation. Uh, so um, there, there is um, uh, some, 
uh, harmonization to be done and and we are we are involved in that work but um this this legislation by the way has a quite similar um timeline as as the sustainable corporate governance initiative so we expect a proposal uh, also by the end of this year but this also again says that we are still fully in the process of of uh, elaborating the the details of of it so there i must admit um it's uh difficult for me at the moment to give specific uh, replies uh, as long as we are um, in this uh, intermediate uh, stage of, of, of the legislative uh, process. All right. I think uh, the answer to my next question may be along the same lines, but uh, let's, uh, let's uh, try it. Um, uh, there's a question about uh, if the draft of the EU regulations include any uh, logo or claim that will be applied uh, on uh, packaging uh, that is similar to the EU uh, organic regulation. Yeah, no, it does not at the moment. Um, we, we still, um, for, for that, uh, we think companies uh, can continue use labels like the fair trade label or, or um, such, um, as long as there is some alignment of, of these uh, private standards with uh, with the criteria of, of the legislation. And these criteria will again reflect the, the international um, guidelines and standards that are out there. So everybody, every private uh, label or, or standard scheme, which, which is aligned with the UN guiding principles, for example, um, will also um, to, um, will have a high um, chance to be uh, um, fully compatible with, with the legislative proposal that we uh, make. Yes. OK, I think. Uh... We are approaching the end of our time. I thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, okay, let's take one last question. Uh, Patrick uh, Zeal, please. Patrick, you have your hand raised. You should be given the- Okay, can, 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 can you, can you uh, hear me now? Yes, yeah. uh, we hear you. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, I think very good discussions. Uh, my little concern is that um, as a country, we also are just about undergoing a robust um, um, regulatory um, system. Um, following the discussion, I come to think about um, where would our um, the new regulation and proposals that will be coming up how would we? How would it sync together with in-country uh, new regulation? Do we, therefore, as a country, hold on until we see a clear way about how the global regulatory framework will come, and then we can pick the pillars as a guide in developing in-country policies, or we can still go on, and then when it comes, before we come back to to change our in-country policies, I don't know whether my question makes sense. Yes, thank you. It does make sense. Uh, and the, the answer is no, you of course do not have to uh, hold on until um, the, the proposal is uh, is adopted um, because uh, you have already sufficient orientation uh, when you look at uh, OL, um, international labor organization conventions, for example, core labor standards, and again, the UN guiding principles and the OECD guidance. So the <clears throat> The existing international standards um, um, provide the type of guidance that that uh, can uh, provide reassurance to you that whatever you do, which is aligned to to the existing international standards, uh, will then also um, be compatible with, with our proposal. Thank you, Pat. Uh, I hope that answered your question, Patrick. If I, if I'm not mistaken, you're from Ghana, so you should be able to benefit from the ongoing discussions uh, about COCO uh, also. So um, maybe check your colleagues uh, in uh, COCO. Um, with that, I think we, uh, we have come to the end of our time here. I, uh, in one sense, I'm uh, uh, relieved that um, our other speaker did not uh, show up because uh, I see even the time uh, uh, we were uh, allotted uh, for just the one speaker uh, was uh, insufficient to cover everything that uh, is involved in these uh, ambitious uh, proposals. And um, I, in my time in coffee, which uh, is uh, 
longer than I would like to, to recall, uh, but uh, I've seen uh, significant uh, progress, I think, uh, in these matters, but there's still a lot, a lot to do. And um, from what uh, Matthias said, this is, uh, this is uh, something that is uh, complex and uh, will take uh, uh, time, but it is uh, something that I think uh, we all, uh, wherever we stand in the coffee value chain, uh, we all uh, support and are uh, interested in. Um, as, as was said here, um, voluntary standards are uh, interesting, they are good, but they can only achieve uh, so much. Uh, to uh, go beyond a certain point, uh, regulation is uh, necessary. Um, I, I note uh, that uh, uh, the, the idea is to have uh, regulation that is not uh, heavy handed, uh, but is still effective. And I look forward uh, very much uh, to seeing all of this uh, being put into practice and, um, and uh, becoming more uh, concrete. Um, finally, Matthias, if you could um, take a, a message to Leonard about uh, uh, the suggestion uh, Gerardo made earlier about uh, some kind of a workshop for ICO members. Uh, to uh, be more uh, effective in their contact with the delegations of the EU in uh, the respective countries. I think uh, this would be very helpful for our stakeholders also. So with that, I thank you all for your presence. Thank you, especially Matthias uh, for your presentation, uh, which uh, sparked a lot of uh, uh, thoughts and debate. And um, we will uh, come back at a later date uh, to, uh, to look at the German proposal. Thank you all. And um, for ICO members, uh, we will uh, see you in the next uh, two weeks uh, when we have our council sessions and related meetings. Thank you all. Uh, good afternoon, good night to Kobayashi-san in Japan, and uh, well, Santiago, you still have a long day ahead of you, so uh, thank you all for joining us today. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye.